Get the Bluetooth off. No, it was muted. Oh, that's okay. interesting. Make sure that it's up. Yeah, because I'm trying to get on it on this phone and it's not. There it is. I realized the other day, okay. quite often, I'm in um, oh. a brown dress. That's interesting. I think I must wear the same dresses on the same days of the week without realizing it. Tuesday, I wear brown. I didn't know I wore brown. But. Well, you know, we used to wear all the same color all the time because that's what we bought a lot of. That's true. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. We used to buy material in yeah. bulk, and we would. I'd have a lot of the same. I'd always have black pants and yeah. a lot of the same color. So It works. I wondered if people thought I only had one shirt. It worked because I always wore some certain colors, and sometimes I wore them two, three days. That's true. People probably thought those poor people. Hello. Hey, Courtney. Hey, Nikki. Love you. I was just sitting here a minute ago talking to Paul about our son-in-law, Andy, did our message on Sunday, and oh, it was so good. Andy is really anointed of God. He really is. And we are not able to broadcast that because we were at a park and then the audio doesn't pick up well. And we so did we, the music, we but did I did the didn't music, check it. So I don't know how it sounded. Probably noisy. Hey, sweet Suzanne. Lots of uh, trucks going by and children laughing. Woo children playing in the park. Hey, Lori. So good to see y'all. It is a very warm day here. I don't know if you can see my cheeks are red. I've been outside and inside and back and forth and going back outside when we're done. I need to cut grass and plant some veggies. Angie uh, doesn't sweat. She sparkles. <laughs> I was about to say. Uh, yeah. She, she glistens. I get the vapors. In no, the south, we no, get the vapors. No, there's no vapor. Men do that. <laughs> Men have the vapor. Oh, you're funny. Hey, Cheryl. Honey, she, uh, Cheryl asked for prayer for her sister, Sandy, who's having surgery today. Okay. Girl, there's grass. The mm -hmm. chickweed is like up this tall. We have had a warm end of winter so far. Okay. Hey, Roberta. Uh, Cheryl, we'll be praying for your sister today as we enter into prayer. You ready, Freddie? I'll give everybody else another chance. If you've got other people you want to mention in prayer, go ahead and post. Um, cause we sometimes jump right in and just open in prayer for our Bible study, but we can use this as a time to lift up our nation, lift up uh, your prayer needs, too. Yes. It has been very nice weather. Very nice Freezing weather. Freezing in California. Uh, Peyton needs prayers for asthma and a cold. Yeah, it's. I think it's going up to 78 today. It was 77 yesterday. I think it's going to start dropping off, though. Well, I don't know that it's going to get too cold, but I was looking at the 10-day forecast. It, it still looks pretty reasonable. I just wish our temperature would do something other than like the stock market, you know, where it's... Up, down, up, down, up, down. Yep. You know, like everybody says, why did the stock market drop today? Nobody knows. Why did the temperature drop today? Nobody knows. It's been beautiful outside, though. I did have to get sting swabs at Walmart yesterday because mm. it's that time of year. We have wasps and honeybees, and I hadn't seen any yellow jackets. Yep. We don't Although have tobacco, the... so tobacco is probably better than sting swabs. for. Actually, I do. Do you? Are I... you dipping the snuff again, honey? No. I actually bought a pouch of pipe tobacco a while back, and I keep it in the pantry okay. for just such an occasion. Okay. So Plus, it smells like my daddy's pipe used yeah. to. You you can tell a level-headed Southern girl because she's got the snuff runs out of both sides of her mouth. Right? That is so gross. What? That is so gross. Most, most of you remember somebody when we were younger that had a snuff. I, I think do. my grandmother was a snuff dipper. You didn't want to give her a kiss. I remember when Haley worked at the nursing home. So she 
she sometimes would have to go to the store and buy different residents their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that is a job I wouldn't want to have. But they, you know, they had to have it. Yeah. They, they had to have it. They had to have it. Now, if y'all dip snuff, please don't be offended. Yep. Hi, Emma. Oh. Um, Suzanne asked for prayer, too, dealing with her pain levels. Hey, sweet mm -hmm. Anna. And... Lenny and Gary, I, I'm assuming they're out of their COVID hit, but hopefully, hopefully. Praise the Lord. Yesterday evening, our beautiful cat Elvis came home after being missing for six wow. months. <gasps> we are so happy. Thank God for bringing him back. Amen. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a miracle, Anna. Wow. Praise God. That's impressive. I, I love, love it when like lost that. things are found. <laughs> I know. Okay, I we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and lift up these needs. Father, we thank you for bringing us together for study today. We ask, Lord, that you meet these needs. And, and Lord, just bless this one that's having surgery and also uh, this one that's sick. Father, we ask that you touch them in body and be with the family and give them peace. Let them know that you have everything under control. Be with Angie today, Lord, as she brings forth the word of God. And I'll let the Holy Spirit be here with us all and, and uh, help us to understand it and grow in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if I um, keep having to do this, we've got uh, pollen really bad. All our vehicles are yellow down here with the oh. pine pollen. <coughs> yeah, even the port, the deck out here is yellow. Yep. Um, Lori said, Mike choose, and one day I accidentally grabbed his Coke bottle. Oh, my word, it's a miracle we're still married. Ooh, that's rough. Belinda said, thank you for your prayers. It is 650 a month loss in pay, but I was placed in another position at work. I will just look for another job to help. God is good, and he takes care of his children, Belinda. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, he is taking care of you, taking care of you. And remember, any time during this, if you have a prayer request, you want to post it. When we go back over and read the comments after the broadcast, we'll pray. I know some of the other ladies do that, too. It's very important. Praying for his deliverance, Lori. Amen. You know, tobacco is so addictive. It is addictive. But there again, there's lots of things that are. Coffee, we, we cut our coffee down to half decaf and half regular just to you know, reduce it down um, for blood pressure issues and things like that. But people don't realize all the things that have caffeine, chocolate, tea, all of that stuff has caffeine and it, it is addictive and it's terrible. You know, we really don't have much caffeine because we, we went to the first part of the day is only half caffeine and anything after that's decaf. So that's true. Um, did you no. know that chocolate has caffeine in it? Yeah, but I don't really eat a lot of chocolate. Yes, well, aren't you wonderful? You don't either. I eat much less than I used to. Yeah. Okay. I eat much less. So we are on Keepers at Home. And I know this seems like a very long study of being a keeper at home, but I, I found it to be extremely interesting. I have too. Um, it's always amazing at the depth that you go into on these studies uh, you find a topic and you can go week after week and find more scripture and talk about it and this i've only seen a little bit of today's front, front page actually but um take it away angie <laughs> paul really doesn't ever pre-study he just gets it like y'all do as it comes out i just uh i got an office in that direction of the house and the days I'm home, and which seems to be most days lately, I take my lunch break here, so I just pop in here. He does. He works right up until time for us to have Bible study, yeah. and then he goes back. Praise God he's here. And next year, he'll be retired, so we won't <clears> have to worry. Yep, next I'm already time. tired, so I'll be retired, retired next year. So today, we are continuing on in our spot cleaning, and we're going to talk about cleaning um, again. <clears> and... You know, somebody might say, well, can we be done with this and move on? But I don't know about you ladies, but cleaning is a huge part of my daily life every day. 
doesn't matter how much you got clean yesterday. There's a whole bunch more to clean today. Do y'all find that to be true? I mean, you can wash every dish in the house and five minutes later, somebody's going to come and need something to drink. And that, <laughs> when we're having the kids, all the grandkids are here, we'll have every glass in the cabinet drunk out of, sat down on the counter, and then I will find a child going back in there in the cabinets trying to find another cup. So we, you know, and I, I want to say, can you just keep up with that cup that you had? But you know what? There's too many. Mm. And I don't let them drink in the living room or anything. They can only drink in the dining room and kitchen or outside. They cannot drink in the living room or the playroom. So all the cups get set on the counter. And so there's always something more to wash. Mm -hmm. But that is a blessing. That is a blessing. So I wanted to read this quote, which I found extremely interesting. It's by Dr. Dave Mihalovich. The most widespread and lethal diseases in the last 200 years were reduced due to cleaner drinking water. Improved sanitation, nutrition, less crowded areas, and better living conditions. Hmm. This was in a statement that was discussing vaccinations, and we're not going to get into that. But the point being, the majority of those diseases were reduced, not through chemical means, but through cleaning. Hmm. Pretty, pretty interesting amazing. yeah because you know 200 <laughs> years ago they didn't even know that there could be anything in the water that contaminates you they knew if it tasted bad or if something dead was in it but they didn't know that there were things possibly they couldn't see or smell or taste so clean drinking water and that just goes along with our focus on cleaning and making sure you're doing deep cleaning in your home and spiritually I'm amazed at people that still don't know to wash their hands and do simple things of cleaning. I know it. I know it. Oh, thanks, Belinda. I am too. I'm learning a lot. So we are in, like I said, this is the section on spot cleaning. And I call it spot cleaning because to me, when I'm cleaning, yes, I have to clean the whole house. I have to do the entire kitchen or I have to vacuum the entire car, all the carpets in the house. But sometimes there's a spot that really needs extra attention. And actually right this minute, my car doors are open because yesterday when I went through the car wash and I was vacuuming out the car, I noticed so many spots where things had been spilled in my car, which drives me to insanity. So I came home I opened up the doors, I got out the mats, I sprayed Resolve carpet cleaner all over. I'm letting it dry, and then I'm going to go out there and vacuum all the things again. Would you do mine next? I will. <laughs> I will, honey. I'm a, I'm a messy. She's a cleanie. I'm a messy, and together we're like, happy. Yeah, together we're happy. Track. That's right. She likes to cook. I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so... When I see a spot that needs special attention, I'm going to put my attention to that. And that's why I wanted to, to use that as the topic of this, this set of studies is because when you see something within yourself that you are constantly being attacked by the devil on, God's trying to focus your attention. He says, I want to deal with this right now in your life. Mm -hmm. If there's some, you know, we call it a pet peeve. If you have a pet peeve, I have several pet peeves, one of which is smacking. If someone is eating or chewing gum, I cannot handle smacking. And I don't hear it because <laughs> if I don't have my hearing aids in, sometimes with my hearing aids, and sometimes I'll get the look. And I'm over here, white reading, you know, and then I'll feel her burning a hole through me with her <laughs> eyes. I try very hard not to be and rude And you'll see to me you. go. <laughs> he takes the gum out and throws it away. <laughs> she said, you don't have to throw it away. Just, I said, just I can't. Just close your lips. <laughs> right. 
Yes. So because that is a pet peeve of mine, I think sometimes the Lord intentionally allows me to walk into a room or a group of people where everybody's smacking. But love is not rude, so That's I right. get rid of the gum. And I don't fuss at you. No. I don't chew you out. You just look. She don't fuss you. So if you have a pet peeve in your life, sometimes you may find the Lord bringing that to your attention more often to help you deal with it. It does. It's not saying that that pet peeve is not valid. The point is, how do we respond to that? Do we get angry? Do we fuss? Do we argue? Do we may belittle someone who may be involved in that? No, we want to. We want to respond with Christ-like attitude. Mm -hmm. And the same thing when you're looking at cleaning your house. If you see something that somebody has messed up or broken or dirtied do you yell and scream do you pitch a fit do you get mad at them or do you just deal with it so again i'm relating the practical everyday thing to the spiritual how you respond and i'm gonna tell you i'm right there with everybody else sometimes i do not respond christ-like sometimes i just lose my cool and I think that may be why the Lord has given us so many grandbabies to be in this house to help me learn. It's just stuff. It's just things. It's just a house. It's not It's not eternity. I thought that was training to raise ducks. Training to raise ducks. Yeah, having all these kids so I get them all in one little herd. I thought that was what that, that was that cool. could be so we could learn to raise ducks better and you know of, of all of our animals out there the ducks are the easiest they don't cause us any grief <laughs> uh Lori said i certainly wasn't christ-like with chewing my mouth um, hey marie it's good to see you so how one thing that's vitally important and i'll be honest with you a lot of people that i've known a lot of women, they miss this step of cleaning. And I want to share it with you because to me, this is one step that people don't necessarily think about, but it is vitally important. Cleaning mm -hmm. your cleaning tools. Now, we've talked about disinfecting. We've talked about um, sweeping and mopping we've talked about a lot of different things in this study and today we're going to talk about cleaning your cleaning tools and if you're joining this for the first time on youtube or one of the broadcasts and you don't normally follow her understand that she is talking about spiritual uh parallel of this not a lady's cleaning and why you should clean this is all spiritual related yeah, but it, it also, for young, young stay-at-home moms, maybe they're just learning. So I throw out a little bit of practical here, too. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Ann, I've been missing you, and I got up this morning praying for you. So she's driving home from Connecticut. I love you. You be careful. So everything, when you're talking about cleaning tools, and let's go over that. We're talking about brushes, sponges, brooms, mops, um uh washcloths um anything that you use for cleaning you have to make sure it's clean to start with because if you start with something dirty you're just spreading germs and dirt right you're not really doing much good and and i'll tell you even a hairbrush do you clean your hairbrush you need to be cleaning your hairbrush um so we're going to talk about the aspects of each one of these. And I believe it or not, I have scriptures to go with them. So we will start with hot water. Very few things do not require hot water to clean. Of course, some things you wouldn't use hot water because you would damage the structure of whatever that is. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's something. But pretty much every cleaning tool needs hot water to clean. So, of course, we have talked repeatedly about the Word of God being the water of the Word. It cleanses, it, it restores, it does all of that. So you always want to begin with water. Um, and I was going to get some, some things to be objects for you to see. 
Belinda said, my mother taught by example, wash brushes every Saturday evening. See, and I love that, that routine. I love that pattern of organization every Saturday evening. So mm -hmm. you get up in the morning on Sunday morning, you start out clean, right? right. That's very important. So we're going to talk about brushes and sponges. Brushes, hair brushes, sponges, um, scrub brushes at your sink, um, mops. mops. We have an egg brush. It's actually a fingernail brush, but we call it our egg brush. And it sits over there by the sink. Well, every couple of days, if not every day, depending on what's been going on with the eggs, I put it in the dishwasher at night when I run the dishwasher. Really? I do. Did You didn't know that? No. I do. I put it on the top rack of the dishwasher. Never saw it in there. Yep. Because I, I can't handle that it's washed dirty eggs, so I have to wash it. Um. So anyway, you know, it goes through the dishwasher and it, um, now let me say, anybody who says, I didn't know you had a dishwasher. We didn't have a dishwasher for over 20 years because I just wouldn't use it. And then we got a, another dishwasher. And then we got all these grandkids. Yes, and whoo, it helps. Um, so you want to take sponges, brushes, all of that, and soak them. Soak means to steep, to lie in fluid, L-I-E, lie down, lay down, put it down in fluid. To draw in by the pores, when you're talking about soaking in a bathtub, you draw that into your pores. To drink in fully. So if you're going to be washing your brushes, your mop, your your sponges, all of that, first step is to soak them in hot water. Submerge. Let it could be completely enveloped in that water. So I know I can hear y'all's wheels turning. You know where I'm going with this. You must immerse yourself in the Word of God on a regular basis in order to be able to allow your spirit to pull up impurities. I don't know about y'all. I say that a lot, but I go through my Bible and when I'm doing Bible studies or just Bible reading, I never finish without feeling convicted about something. Never. I, it's, it's like it may not even be something that was on my mind, but God will just have it just float up in my spirit. Angie, what about this? Mm. Need to be repenting of that. That needs to change in your life. Mm. Mm. It just floats out. And the same thing, if you put some dirty sponge down in hot water in your sink, you push it down in there, you, you know, you squeeze the water out as it goes down so it sucks up the new water. And guess what happens? You start seeing all these little particles floating up, floating out of that sponge or that brush or whatever just floats up to the top. It's amazing. Because water brings out impurities. Um, and I didn't even do a scripture on that because it, it we've covered it a thousand times. And y'all know what I'm talking about here. Um, the next thing is once that's pulled out of the water, what do you do with the sponge? Do you just lay it on your counter? No. You... I stand them upright. I don't lay them flat. I stand them upright. And so all of that water can drain out. And as I was preparing this study and thinking about how I do stuff, you know, if I've got a, br a brush or anything, I'll stand it up in the little, the little utensil drain. I don't lay it flat. I stand it up. And I was thinking, I always put it upright so it can completely drain out. And then I started thinking of scriptures about being upright and standing upright. So, the woman. <laughs> 2 Samuel 22, verse 26. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. Would you read that again? With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. There have been times in my life where I thought God was just pure old mad at me because it seemed like everywhere I turned, there was another problem, another situation. And 
I realized I was going through a time of cleansing. He was cleansing me. He was scrubbing me. And we're going to get to that. Scrubbing me, scrubbing me, scrubbing me. But it felt like I was overwhelmed. And I found this scripture one day as I was praying and asking God. And he, he spoke to my heart. You feel like you're being mistreated. But I don't mistreat my children. Mm. I grow my children. Wow. And with the upright, when, when, they, when we have cleaned the grit out of our lives, our attitudes are being corrected. All of that is being corrected. You begin to feel yourself lifted up because God is lifting you up. You're no longer overwhelmed and overweighted with the cares of this world, with the stress, with the problems, and you begin to literally lift up. And I think about a hot air balloon. Have you ever seen when they raised one? They take this thing out into a field, and you know there's the basket, the gondola, and then the, the balloon is flat. It's on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they start the process, and slowly that thing fills. Yeah. And it lifts. They use a fan to get it puffed up. And right. then they start blowing heat into it. Blowing heat into it. Yeah. Think about that spiritually. How yeah. when, the, when the, the pressure builds inside that balloon and that thing just raises up. And when you're going through turmoil, when you're going through stress, when you feel the weight of everything, the, the scripture and the worship and all of that coming together just begins to lift us up into an upright spiritual position. Mm. So when you're washing out your kitchen sponges and you soak them down in that water and the particles of filth have come up, they've risen and flushed away down the drain, and then you want to set yourself and walk in what you've just learned. Amen. Walk in what you've just been taught of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Walk upright. Don't go back to laying in the filth again. Don't think, well, you know, but what about this? And what about that? And they were mean to me. And God doesn't really love me or he wouldn't let this happen. And look, I'm sick again. That is that oppressive thing that drops you back down. Stand upright in your spirit and proclaim that God does love you, but you have to repent and then move upright. Upright, whole, entire, sound, healthful, unimpaired. I really love that one. Innocent, having integrity, having truth without spot and undefiled. Now, that is the, the definition in the Strong's Concordant for upright, undefiled, without spot. All of us could quickly find spots within ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that constant washing, that constant soaking, that constant surrender to the movements of the Lord in our life removes spot after spot after spot. Do you agree? Yes. Your wheels are turning. I was thinking about the apostles. Share. Well, just that even after the church formed, after Jesus ascended and left the disciples to who were the apostles after that, that even Peter had to be corrected by Paul mm. at one point. And then Paul was in error when he um, turned against John Mark because John Mark fell away at one point and then Paul didn't want anything more to do with him but Barnabas took him and you know basically had more mercy than Paul did and took him those two and it was all part of God's plan but right. you know these men were not perfect they they had things spots. they got through they had yeah. spots <coughs> but they didn't get mad get offended throw up their hands and say I'm done with this I'm just going home nobody's happy with what I'm doing I'm right. just going home well, you know, it's the church that hurts everybody, so I'm just giving up. It's pretty amazing that Paul, quicker than Peter, had opposed him about him siding with the Jews and becoming more Jewish around Jewish believers and more Gentile around Gentile believers. And basically, Paul said, take off the mask, mm. you know? Uh, yes. 
you know, we, we put a mask That's on. That's good. We act a certain way around certain people. We can act clean around the godly people. and Yeah. So we just need to take off the mask and be who we are. That's right. And and if we don't really like who we are. Change it. Change it. <laughs> don't stay in it. Don't stay in it. Let's read Psalm 710. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. I I really don't like just putting in one scripture because there's so much in context before and after. But for sake of time, I have to do that. My defense is of God. When you know that you are following the word of God, what you are doing, what the Holy Spirit of God is leading you to do, you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to lay down and give up and say, this isn't working. Just keep plowing forward because that's what the body of Christ is for, is to plow forward and get the word into those those places that, again, I go back to a sponge. Y'all don't realize all these things that go through my head, all of these images I see of a huge sponge you know when you squeeze that thing out as much as you can and then you release it and how that whole thing just opens up all these little little holes and crevices just open up to be refilled again so when you've been squeezed to the max and you just can't take it anymore guess what's coming the release the opening up where you can draw in all of that beautiful new and you become useful again. Let him squeeze you if he wants to. Let him put you in a tight place and wring out everything so that you can receive the next glorious thing he's got for you. Don't get mad at God and don't get mad at others when they are trying your soul. Realize it's just a squeezing and it's going to stop. And then the new is coming. Don't you just love that about God? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 26, 7. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. If you are just, and you, you can only be just through the Holy Spirit's leading and the teaching of the word, you can only truly reach a, a place of justness. Through that, you can't make it up yourself. You can't make a an intellectual decision to be just. It has to come from the Holy Spirit of God because that's an attribute of God, is it not? The way of the just is uprightness. So if you're if you're desiring to be just and right and honorable, the only way that happens is if you walk in your in uprightness with God. If you follow the path of God the way He says, not the way we say, not the way you say, the way God says, then you can walk in that in truth. And I, I just love that. I I just love it. Do you have anything to share on that before we move? No. Okay. The next thing, once you've used water, you've soaked, you've um, been in hot soapy water, gotten all clean, and you've set up right to be to be emptied of all of the old. What's the best thing to do for something like a dirty old sponge or a dirty mop or or even even washcloths that you've used for a dirty task? Or a pillow or pillow. anything that you want to sanitize. Yes. What do you do? What do I do? I sit those things out in the sunshine. And down here in the south, we have lots of sunshine. I have been known to take every quilt in my house and hang it up over the fences out around the pasture out here and I'll, I'll just have quilts hanging everywhere to air dry in the sunshine sheets when I clean the sheets off the bed when it's pretty weather it all goes outside I've taken stuffed animals wash them put them all outside hung them up by their little bunny ears or their little tiger tails up on the clothesline sunshine fresh air blowing through because remember when we studied about about um, bacteria and mold and mildew, remember when we talked about that? Where does that usually begin? 
dark, dank places. But when you bring all of that into the sunshine, it kills that nastiness. It kills that bacteria. Put it out in the sunshine. Now, it's really easy. Hey, sweet Yoshana, praying girl. Just praying, praying, praying. When we think about sunshine in our lives, clearly we're talking about the light, mm -hmm. right? So let's look at 1 John 1, <clears throat> 5 through 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus. Christ his son cleanseth us all from sin. Isn't that amazing how the very scriptures that he is talking about God being light, he's talking about cleansing. So for those of us homemakers, when we're doing our cleaning and we're washing out our cleaning tools, when you get them all scrubbed out and you get them set up and they're upright and they're draining and drying, set them outside in the sunshine. I believe they still they sell now UV lights. You can buy a UV light to sanitize things mm. like a phone right. and stuff. Is, and am I right about that? Yeah. So where do you get the UV light? Sunshine. Now, some things, obviously, electronics and stuff may not be, need to be out in the heat, mm -hmm. but your mop, your broom, your scrub brushes, your sponges, all of that can sit out in the sunshine and that just, just refresh and replenishes and kill bacteria. Now, what has that got to do with us spiritually? Well, for the next five hours, I will spend time explaining the first section of that discussion because there's so much more. I'm just kidding. There is a lot when you're talking about the light of God, shining a light in dark places. You remember that thing, um, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me? Well, you know, imagine God saying that to you. You're not hiding anything from God, no matter how hard you might be trying. I can't hide anything from God. He knows it all. So when I'm going to confess my sin, it's not because God didn't know it. He knew it. He knew it before you ever did it. It's for you. It is to shine a light in a dark place in your walk, in your thoughts, in your heart, in your emotions. Go ahead and confess that stuff to the Lord. Now I'm going to tell you something. Making confession, you need to be discerning. You don't need to go out and confess to every Tom, Dick, and Harry everything in your heart. Ladies get in a lot of trouble by running their mouths too much, and they think, well, I, I just want to confess my sin. Well, let me tell you something. Don't be confessing your sin to everybody who listen, because they may not be honorable with that information. Number two, don't be confessing for other people. I don't know if I've heard of that. Oh, yeah. Confessing for other people? Oh, yeah. Sharing the sins of somebody else. Ooh. Now, there does come a time, I believe, that it's wisdom. If you see that somebody is about to be taken in a trap, you pray about that, and then you might need to share, be careful. I've had to do that before in my life where I knew somebody was was honestly trusting another person, and I knew what was coming, and I, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me to warn them. Sometimes it's received, sometimes it's not. Sometimes they look at you like you're just a terrible person, but that's that's up to God to deal with. Ha, I love that. Brenda, Brenda wrote, I mean, Belinda, my mother said, go to the throne and not to the phone. 
That's good. I love it. I need to keep that written down somewhere. Go to the throne and not to the phone. I love it. That is good. But in order to bring light, you've got to open the doors. You've got to get all that mess out, lay it out before the Lord, and allow his light to shine on it. And I'm going to tell you, if you're beginning to get an error in your spiritual walk, maybe you've heard some wonderful new preacher that's got this great new method of following God. Pray about it. Wait. Allow the sun to come out over that teaching and allow God himself to reveal the truth of that. It may be right on target, but a lot of times there's just enough there to twist the word of God. Mm. We see that a lot, don't we? Yeah, we're, we're quick to jump on the bandwagon of the, the latest whatever is stirring and we, we need to wait. Yes. Because... Uh, Test the spirits, right? That's right. Test the spirits because, boy, it can really cause a <coughs> havoc in a life. <clears throat> so, put it out there in the sunshine. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to reveal the truth. The next thing I wanted to share is if you've got brushes, a hairbrush, <coughs> a scrub brush, when it gets really contaminated, and you know there's there's the bristles, and then there's the under part, the base that the bristles are attached to. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that we used to do was we'd throw our hair brushes. You know, you clean them out with a, a comb. You get all the hair out of it, and then you throw it in the washing machine with a load of clothes. Mm -hmm. And you just let it wash. You don't throw it in the dryer, but you throw it in the wash. And when you get it out of the wash, a lot of times it's completely clean. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, there's still some grit and grime under there. And... Hopefully that's not your hairbrush, but, but you know, so what do you do then? If you have a scrub brush, that's got a lot of grit and grime down low where the bristles attach to the brush, you take another brush and you scrub the brushes against each other. Scrub, 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 rinse, 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 scrub, 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 rinse, rinse, rinse. And you check that. You look at the brushes, make sure all of that grit and grime is gone. And if it's not, what are you going to do? Scrub, scrub, scrub. Abrasiveness against abrasiveness, getting it all off. That way you know that it's not just surface clean, it's in-depth clean. Which, of course, brought me to the scripture of Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Scrub, scrub, scrub. It is so easy to get upset when somebody does something we just do not like. That pet peeve thing, you can get so irritated. If somebody says something that's really baby true, but you didn't want to hear it. But even if not, even if it's something that they're doing that's completely wrong, completely wrong, again, you cannot change another human being. You can only answer for what you're doing. So if you're letting the sin of someone else eat you up to the point that you have developed hardness in your heart, this is not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. That iron in them is trying to sharpen the iron in you, and you can't bang it when you're doing something in the blacksmith shop. Have you ever hit something and Made it so crooked you had to put it back in the fire and start all yeah, over? all the time. Is there like a word for that or just a mess up? The word is... <laughs> <laughs> I don't swear, never have, but, you know, I've... Ah! <laughs> There's so many times when you get something <laughs> almost made after an hour and a half of hammering and heating and hammering and heating, and then you get it to that final thing, you pull it out, and... And see, you just said something really, really good. Okay. When you get to the final stage, it's one more shot, one more hit with that hammer to, to get it to the finished product. 
And that's when the bang happens that hit wrong. Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. And and it's it's abrasive. It's it's not easy. It's not fun. I mean, if you've ever seen something being sharpened, sometimes there can be sparks flying off. The, With, the critical part of that passage we just read in Proverbs, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. His friend. Your enemies will have correction for you that you don't need to listen to. That's true. They will tell you, you're offending me, or you shouldn't judge me, or whatever. But if you get someone that you know is your friend, mm -hmm. someone that is loves you, and, and it may sound a little harsh even. Yeah. Wait a minute. This person cares about me. That's right. Right. Receive it in the way that it's being done. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out because so often we, we do respond more in our life to someone who doesn't give a rip about us. Is good, that okay to say? Going back to the blacksmith and a good uh, illustration, uh, the last Heritage Festival we did, I was demonstrating uh, making S hooks or something simple. And um, the first man that walked up when they started letting people through, the first man said, you need a bigger hammer for that. About, about in that tone. And I didn't even look up uh, under the brim of my hat. And he just kept on, yeah, you need a bigger hammer. And I said, why is that? And he said, because you get through quicker. And I said, yeah, but it's small material. A big hammer would be too much on it. I said, I have a bigger hammer, but I'm going to use a small hammer. Well, then later on in the day, a man that I knew came by, and he was a blacksmith, and he was looking at my stuff. And he said, and he waited till everybody had walked away. And he said, he said, Paul, you know, if you take these right here and you run, you run this edge down right here with your hammer, he said, That'll give it an octagon look, and he said that that'll have a nice a nice smooth finish to it. He waited till everybody was away. He didn't correct me or right. give me this idea in front of everybody. Like, right. hey, if you know if you, if you do this, so it, it has a lot to do with the tone, and you can tell who oh, yeah. who cares about you yeah. and wants to help a lot of times by the crowd that they're giving that in, right? Yes. Then so you take somebody over to the side, iron sharpens iron. Your brother or your friend is not going to embarrass you. That's right. But if they give it to you on a one-on-one, -on -one, take heed to it. It yes. might be something that immediately ruffles your feathers, but then get let let God do the work in you. I love that. Thank you. I'm thinking about five things that, that I needed to hear that for myself. That's really good. Isn't that good, ladies? Courtney said, I put toothbrushes or brushes in the dishwasher. It does. It does. So remember, instead of allowing yourself to be offended and hurt and wounded, ask yourself in that split second, is this from the Lord? Is the Lord using this to sharpen me, to make me more useful for the kingdom? And if it's not of God, throw it away. But remember, just because it hurts, doesn't mean it's the enemy. Yes. Sometimes it hurts because it's it's cutting away ugly stuff. There have been a lot of people in our lives, Angie and myself, that connected with us mm -hmm. some time later, months or weeks or even years, got offended, left unfriended, whatever. Sometime later, even years later, came back and said, you know, I want to apologize. I had my feelings hurt, but you was right. You you was telling me something, and you I know you cared about me. Then, immediately later, something else happened. Oh, we're, we're friends. We're not friends. We're fr I mean, a lot of people like that mm -hmm. don't do that. Don't be, okay, now we're attached. Now we're not. If you've got somebody that's your friend, it's going to be that there's sometimes they're going to be honest with you and say things that you can't just say, well, I don't want anything more to do with you. Because you hurt my feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say this.
there is a holy of holies. There is an inner place. And you need to be very selective of who's in that inner place in your life. Jesus had his disciples. But then he had that other group of disciples. She's talking about personal relationships, yes. not the spiritual side, but our our yes. relationships. That's right. You were, you were talking about people who come in and go and come in and go and come in and go. Yeah. It's exhausting. But but you know who is that group that you're inner group your holy of holies in your friendships you see what i mean and just like he was talking about there's this exterior group that never gets too close because for whatever reason but don't be offended when people do that to you we we have had to go through a lot of hurt a lot of hurt you know But I say it over and over. Take the meat, spit out the bones. Take, do what you need to do and let the rest of it float away and not don't take it to heart. Because let me tell you something. Jesus had that happen a lot. Yeah. He had it happen a lot. Okay, our next part. Hey, sweet Lenny. The next part we are doing quickly is... um. Feather dusters, uh, feathers, feather dusters, and things that you dust with, stuff that you have debris on. Um, what do you do when you've got a cleaning item that is accumulating lots of dust and lots of debris? Shake it. If you have a feather duster, you go outside and you bang, 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 get all that dust off. It's not going to ne necessarily need to be soaked. Feathers don't need to be soaked. Um, but you're going to shake off that debris. Get it off. You take a, a rug outside and whack it, whack it, whack it with a broom. You want to get that all shaken out. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Yep, I've already posted 24 through 29. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the, the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall, we not, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whoso voice, voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth also, only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, wherefore, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. That's a long passage, and sometimes you have to just sit down and ponder a passage like that because there's a whole lot there. But in reference to what we're talking about today, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you my my uh, explanation of what he's saying here. He's gonna shake everything that can be shaken. This world is going to be shaken. It's been shaken many times. And the things that are man-made, whether it's an earthquake and a building collapses or in your walk, if it's your own thinking, your own ideas, your own contemplations, your fleshly things, as you go through this life, he is shaking to get rid of that stuff out of you. Now, you can keep grabbing hold and pulling it back, spiritually speaking. God can be trying to remove things from you, trying to show you the, the light in situations. But if you don't want to let those things go, you it's like he's shaking you and you keep reaching out and pulling it back. Oh, and I want to drop that. I like that. That's my favorite. I don't, don't do nothing with that. But he's trying to shake us. He's trying to remove that earthly, fleshly, carnal garbage out of our life. Mm -hmm. 
And once he gets all of that out, guess what? He's going to shake whatever's left. Because he doesn't want anything of this world or our flesh man to remain. Mm -hmm. He only wants what's Jesus to remain. And I think about that, that Michelangelo thing and, you know, he did David and, and they said, how did you do that? And he said, I just took away everything that wasn't David from that rock. Have you ever heard of that story before? I have, and I do wood carving and little figurines, and, you know, I've thought of that many times, except in my head, it's like, I back up, and it's like, it's not quite right, but I don't know which part's not right, you know? Right, and you just keep removing until you see. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I end up with a figure this big and a head this big. <laughs> okay, you're not I'm do Michelangelo. I'm doing wood, <laughs> and I go too far, and I end up with a... 12 inch figurine with a marble size head. You're not Michelangelo. No, I'm not. But we don't, we need to be paying attention. If God is trying to shake us, we need to be aware. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is God. This is God because I'm a child of God. I'm serving God. I love God. I'm seeking God's face every single day. But my whole world is in complete and total turmoil. Okay, God, you're shaking my foundation. Show me what you want to show me. Help me turn loose of what I'm depending on or what I'm trusting in or what I'm believing is right. And let me see, Lord, what is remaining in you. And and let me let me tell you, I remember as a young woman saying, Lord, I, I trust you and everything, but just please don't don't let anything happen to this. Or or don't let this person not be in my life anymore. And you know what? Even relationships the ones that you never dreamed would have any issue, those will be shaken too. Yeah. And only the very deepest rooted things that God wants in your life, those are the only things that will and should remain. Did you have anything to share on that? Uh, I was just, my mind was just going with the being shaken and how everything that we do has to be shaken to do right i mean going back to blacksmithing i take something out of the fire and there's an interesting thing that takes place with steel when you pull out it's got this uh, crust on it that flakes off and a lot of people if i'm demonstrating they ask what the, what is that and it's basically rust that burns off of the fire and it leaves it pure underneath so i can get a completely rusty piece of metal and put it in the fire and when I slam it down on the anvil and hit it, all that starts flaking off. And I end up with the, this material that's around it that's knocked off of it. Right. But the what the left, the byproduct or what's left after that is is shiny and you know it's black, but right. it's uh smooth. Right. Clean. It's, it's clean. clean. Yeah. I also wanted to point out in verse 27 where he says, and this word yet once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken remain, those things that are made, they're things that we make. You know, you are making a life. Every day that you wake up, you are making a life, your life. You are molding it and fashioning it based on the things that you care about, the things that you do every day, things that I do. I am making a life. And, we, you know, we talk about making a life for yourself. Mm -hmm. Those things that are not of God, those things are the stuff he's trying to shake away. And we, we really do. <laughs> we really do want to hold on to a lot of things that he does not want us to have. Don't begrudge him when you feel that shaking happening. It is two o'clock, but I really wanted to get through this last bit. Can, Can we, we post the scripture for it? 
We are going to look at the Pharisees. Amen. Hey, sweet Tina. Lenny said, shake everything, dear Lord. Yes. Oh, I love that. Lenny said, yes, like the story of refining gold, not finished until the jeweler sees his image in the reflection. Amen. So we are going to look at Matthew 23, 25 through 27. Just posted that, so I'll give you a minute to find it. Matthew 23, 25 through 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. You know, we have been called Pharisees because we we believe that a, a different outer garment is important based on the word of God. I can show you the scripture. Um. We've gone through it many times, but we've had people that we care about say, well, y'all are just being Pharisees. Y'all expect everybody to do this, and they're not right unless they do this. Never been a thought in our head, not one time, that somebody's got to do what we do in order to be right with God. Never even lost a moment's thought thinking that. Have you thought that? Nope. As a matter of fact, we've told people point blank, don't do this. Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, because just it needs to be a glaring signal from heaven to you to do plain dress and head covering, because otherwise, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But when you're talking about cleanliness, a lot of people don't like that because they think you you're going to look at their stuff and think, oh, y'all are dirty people. One of our girls used to ask us, are they dirty people? <laughs> I don't know if they're dirty people or not. But they it's like when we when we were gonna be homeschoolers, the people who weren't homeschoolers thought we were judging them for sending their kids to school. <laughs> I've never understood that. But you know, if we're plain dressed, they think we're we're passing some judgment on them because they're not plain dressed. Or if we um if I mean, there's so many things like we, that. We don't drink alcohol, and we've got scripture that we base that on. But if you drink alcohol, that's, that's between, that's you, between and God. you and God. And, that's right. You know, we we are teetotalers. You know, uh, coffee totalers. We we don't drink it, but we're not going to judge somebody that does. You know, I hate Bradford pear trees because they are they're they're just not a good plant. They're just not a good plant. But I know a lot of people who have their driveways lined with Bradford pear trees. They go buy Bradford pear trees and put them in their yard. I love you anyway. <laughs> You're going to have misery because you planted those Bradford pear trees, but I'm not judging you. I love you and I, I pray for you. I feel sorry for you because they're going to cause you trouble. It's that kind of thing. If a person can pick apart every little tiny thing and say, well, you, you're judging me because I don't believe that. Well, it's not my job. I have enough trouble trying to keep myself in the path that God's showing me. I don't have time to stand around deciding whether or not you're in the path. Okay? The Pharisee situation was vastly different than someone who is really trying to serve God and may be saying to their their friend or their family member, you know, you really need to steer clear of this problem because it's going to lead to your destruction. That's loving. But a Pharisee is not about being loving. It's about not helping someone to to walk the walk and end up in right standing. They're about control. They don't, the eternal doesn't matter. 
And that's what you need to remember. First of all, if you're calling somebody a Pharisee or if you're thinking they're being a Pharisee or if you're being accused of that, don't be stressed because that accusation is an attempt of the devil to make you shut your mouth and don't say another word to try to help anybody because they're going to get mad at you. A Pharisee's kind of clean has nothing to do with the heart. It has to do with the actions. And let me say, as I read through this, I think about chemical cleaning. Mm. Y'all know what I mean by that? Instead of actually washing something, you just spray it with every chemical you can find thinking that's going to clean it. You know, bleach is a good thing. Bleach really takes care of a lot of issues, bacteria-wise and all that. But bleach can 100% destroy what you put it on if you do it in error. You know, I've had garments where like a little bleach got spilt on something. And when I pulled that thing out of the wash, literally a hole was in it. Bleach, you think of putting it in a in wash with whites and, you know, it makes it brighter. Well, some things, it makes it yellow. It turns that garment yellow. So bleach, while it has good good things about it, it can damage beyond repair. Bleach can be too harsh. And when I think about the Pharisees, that's what I think about, that bleaching, whitewashed sepulchers where they're just bleached out. There's no life. There's nothing left. To clean, in verse 26, thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which was is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. When you're washing a dish, you don't pick up a bowl that's had um, chili in it, and you just wipe the outside of that bowl and sit it in your dish drainer. You you clean the inside first. First of all, you rinse it underwater and get all of that out. And then you get your soapy wash rag and you wash the inside and you flip it over and you wash the outside. Then you rinse it again. There's a process of cleaning. So if we're not dealing with what's on the inside of us, how can we possibly help someone else? The, the actions that you take, the head covering, the plain dress meant nothing to me. Until I was under the conviction of the Lord about what the word of God was saying. Never even thought about it before. Never even crossed my mind except to think, well, those poor people, those poor Amish and those poor Mennonites, they're just under bondage. Never thought about something like that having any validity till I studied the word and studied church history and God's people and And then I began to see the truth and see the light through study. To clean in this, in verse 26, that the outside of them may be clean also, pure, physically purified by fire, in a similitude like a vine cleansed by pruning and so fitted to bear fruit. We have a plum tree that's planted out at the end of our between our duck pen and our turkey pen, and we have battled for about five years now a fungus on that tree. We've cut it back, we've cut it back, we've cut it back, and it's it's there now, and that fungus is all over it again. We're just going to absolutely have to dig up that tree and burn it, and we won't be able to plant anything there for a long time because that fungus will be in the soil. There's a time to plant and a time to dig up. Mm -hmm. And if there's things in your life that are continually bearing bad fruit, dig it up, burn it with the Holy Spirit's fire. That's why I think on that last section, he said, for our God is a consuming fire, a fire that burns up all the dross, just like Lenny was talking about, getting rid of the impurities and the gold until the master can see his face and the shine and the reflection. Um, the clean in verse 26 is also talking about the Levitical sense, which is from the Levites in the Hebrews. 
the use of that which is for not forbidden, that's clean. If you're using something forbidden, that's dirty, that's filthy. It something that doesn't make something dirty. It's not it's not cleaning necessarily, but it's not making more dirty. And ethically, free from corrupt desire, from sin and guilt, free from every admixture of which is false, sincere, genuine, blameless, innocent, unstained with the guilt of anything that's clean, unstained with the guilt of anything. Now, I'll tell you, there's some people out there doing ungodly things and they feel no guilt. They are dead within. This is not clean. This is dead. The dead feel no guilt. That's true. So when we're talking about Pharisee cleaning or clean, we're not talking about Holy Spirit clean. So equate that chemical cleaning to real work of cleansing something properly. Is that totally confusing? Oh, I got to read comments. Hang on. Anna said, does different conviction and how to dress, what to do, have something to do with the scripture that talks about that we get different strength of faith? What I mean is, do you and Paul maybe have a stronger, more mature? What I mean is, do you and Paul maybe have a stronger conviction that comes from a stronger, more mature faith? You know, Anna, I feel... The stronger, more mature faith, I feel like I'm becoming more of a baby every day in the faith. I I feel like my maturity, the older I get, the further I get with the Lord, the less mature I feel. Well, I have to say, from a man's point of view, Angie started dressing plain long before I did. I still dressed in blue jeans and patterned shirts and whatever. But I did with your permission. Sure. Well, I, yes, we, we came to that conclusion. And I think it was probably a year or two later, I was jealous at the, at the, um, in a godly sense of the opportunities y'all had to witness to people. We would be in Walmart, we'd be in the grocery store, we'd be out anywhere in public. And Angie and the girls would have people come up and they'd be talking to these people about the Lord and, I would just stand there, and uh, then I thought, and one day I told her, I said, I don't feel like I have that same opportunity, and she said, well, I can make you broad fall pants or whatever. Anyway, it was um, it was a eye-opening thing to start dressing plain and unadorned and that kind of thing, because even as a man, I used to think, you know, hey, I, could, I look good in a leather jacket, right? You know, I look. Lo- I, those pants make me look better. It's always about how you look. And I found out that we were much more approachable for spiritual reasons when we were plain, when we were, would you not say that? Yes. I mean, that's just a sidetrack of this conversation, but it was very humbling to feel like that I was not um, well-dressed and business-dressed. And I had, you know, I have, I work in a company, an office environment, and I always made sure I was nicely dressed. She made nice broad fall pants and um, button down shirts and that kind of thing. So for, for a woman's point of view, I'm sure it is very crucifying to the flesh to do it. it it's is. not something you want to do. That's why so many people that we've known said, oh, that's for me. We want to do that. But then a few months later, they fall away. That's what she's saying. Don't do it unless you're convicted. Um, yeah. We've been playing for nearly 25 years now. And and I'll tell you, the devil doesn't get me in that area anymore. Yeah. He doesn't make me feel bad. Yeah. I don't feel I don't feel anything and, uh, about it tell, anymore. Tell him about the, since we're talking about this, tell him about the bondage that that pastor told you you was in. We're going to spend time on that. Okay. Um, w- what he's talking about, Anna, is we had a pastor and his they were new and his wife, they were ha- at our home for dinner and we were just chatting after the meal. And and I think they really had a heart's desire to help us be delivered from being plain because it was not a plain church. It was, you know, 
anyway, they were sitting there and, and she, she made the comment about, you know, me being under this bondage. And uh, the pastor was sitting there and he was talking and he said, you know, that really it's not, it's not a salvation issue. The Lord doesn't require this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I said, well, pastor, I said, tell me how long it took your wife to get ready to come to dinner tonight. And, and he looked at her and she looked at him. He said, well, it, about an hour, you know, do the hair, the makeup pick a dress or an outfit. She didn't wear dresses. And he said, it, it took about an hour. I said, now ask me the same thing. And he knew where I was going. And I said, well, it took me about five minutes. Because, you know. And I said, so tell me now, how much money did she spend on her hairdo and her garments and her makeup? And, and they looked at each other and kind of chuckled and laughed because, obviously she spent a lot of money and I said I make my clothes I buy fabric make my clothes you know not much money spent there now it is because fabric's gone so high and I said so who is in bondage here who stresses over their hair who stresses over their makeup you can't cry in church because your mascara runs you can't go here or go there because you don't have the right outfit or you don't feel pretty that's bondage to me that's bondage and I used to be that person I was very modern in my dress and my hairdos and all that anyway so I, I can't say that it's because we're stronger faith or anything else I just say because I read the word he reads the word and we submit it to God and follow the word of God Ephesians 5 25 and through 27 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He's talking to the husbands here. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I posted a thing yesterday that said the way a man treats his wife is how he feels about God. That's not exact, but it's paraphrased. If you see a man treating his wife with disrespect and, and lack of communication, lack of care, lack of attention, just, just treating her abominably, that's how he feels about Jesus. I mean, it just is. He has no respect for his wife. He has no respect for Jesus because husbands are to treat their wives as Christ treats the church. Amen. And I, I will say this about my husband, absolutely 100% right on target. And he looks out for my needs. He, he is the most beautiful companion I could ever ask for. He is loving. He is giving. I know that Jesus loves me because I know this man. Now, that's fact. Why? Why does Christ do all of this? even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He did all of this so that he could sanctify us. And can you tell what sanctify means? Set apart. Set apart. Sets us apart and cleanses us with the washing. Isn't that interesting, though, how he adds the water of the word in with the cleansing? Do you see why I keep bringing it in through all of this study? Why? So that he can present us as a glorified church. No spot, no wrinkle, no blemish, nothing. But he's doing it for us, cleansing us. So when we look at the Pharisees, why do they want to give out all those rules? And Lenny posted, yes, the Pharisees were all about the legal law, power, and pride. They lost touch. You got you guys are all about being obedient and loving God's word and Lord Jesus. That's what we we pray shows. And Anna said the Lord was never noticed for his looks. Something to think about. Absolutely. I tell you, it's a process we're all going through. Every day, 
every effort. Like I said before, we are all making a life. We are crafting a life. And, you know, I've seen people who, who, for all practical purposes, were serving God. And then all of a sudden, they made a decision. They were done. They were going to do it their way. They walked out and they wanted to drag Jesus along with them while they did their their stuff. They wanted just to pull him along just enough. I think somewhere in the brain it's like, well, I'll say praise the Lord and I'll tell people I love God and, and I'll I'll lift my hands and say, I worship you, God. But really that's just what it, what did they used to say? Um fire insurance. Because they didn't want to go to hell and burn in fire forever. So they, they keep saying, oh, I love God. But nothing of their daily walk shows that they're committed and surrendered to the Lord. You can say it all you want to, but action and living this life based on the word of God and the Holy Spirit, that is where it happens. And we cannot walk in truth of the Lord if we don't cleanse ourselves daily. You are not going to have a clean house if you don't clean your cleaning tools. And before I close this, I want to say, if you aren't spending time in your word, if you aren't at least spiritually falling to your knees every day in prayer and repentance, if you are not allowing the worship of God to flow out of you, whether things are good or if things are really rotten at the moment, it better be flowing because that's the only answer for getting rid of the attack of the devil. And I believe that with all my heart. I talk a lot about worship. If you, if you are sobbing your eyes out from whatever's going on, while you sob, you speak worship. And I've told this before too. David, part of the Psalms, David, King David, anointed king by God himself, was crawling on his belly through caves trying to get away from Saul because he was trying to kill him. But that's when he wrote those beautiful songs that we go to all the time while he was crawling through a cave with his army because he was trying to get away from Saul. Mm -hmm. We need to be doing that when we're spiritually or even mentally crawling on our belly just trying to get to one more day. We The song of worship better be coming from us. It better be flowing and if it's not clean yourself spiritually get rid of whatever's hindering get rid of the contaminants that are holding you down flush them out of your life so that you can walk forward and ladies i'm right there with you right there with you i know what it's like because it happens to me too you want to share anything I got some work to do. I do too. You know, I mean, you can't read the word and not be, you shouldn't read the word and it not do something for you. Not You can't, you never should be, as a Christian, read the word and say, I'm good. It's not like doing your taxes where you get to the end, you say, finished. Yeah. It's always a work in progress. It is. You get through it and it's just convicting every time. Yes. That's how you grow. You've got work to do. And you know, I mean, every aspect of your life, ladies, if you're watching, if you're listening, if you are seeking the Holy Spirit, he's going to reveal things to you that you may never have noticed before. And we have that every day. We go down to that barn to milk those goats. We've got one goat that is perfection. We don't have to holler. We don't have to call her. We don't have to whistle. We open that gate. She runs out. She jumps up on the stand. She puts her head in the lock and she starts eating. And we milk and we never have a problem. That other goat fights us. We have to chase her. We have to drag her. You can't not milk her because her udder's so full. She would be in terrible pain. Get her up there. 
I, I, from start to finish, it's nothing but difficult. And every time, morning and night, every time we get in there, Paul will say, Father, forgive me for being like Daisy. And Lord, thank you for Magnolia's example. Yep. Every time without something fail. Like yeah, something like that. Because Magnolia does it. She obeys. She knows what she's supposed to do. And it's so much easier. And if we just, I mean, she gets pampered. It's like goat spa, you know? I know. She gets Rub washed. that udder with that, yeah. She gets milk. She gets petted. She gets feed. She gets special feed that the other goats don't get. She gets washed again at the end. She gets dried. She gets bag bomb put on. And she still acts like we're going to kill her. Yeah, she she gets petted. She's talked to too sweetly. And you just want to, like you always say, you just want to smack her. You just want to smack her. But if you smack her, she'll she'll do it even more. But how much is the Holy Spirit doing that with us? He's guiding us. He loves us. He's leading us. But we say, like that woman said that time about, about, um, never mind. She, but she said, well, it might be fine for you, but I'm never doing that. And I looked at her and I said, never say never. Follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'm going to hush. I'm 25 minutes past, but it was good. It was good. And you covered all your your uh, papers this time. Ah, uh, Lenny said I had a naughty goat and she aimed her back foot in the bucket too. Mm -hmm. Oh, we love y'all. Mm -hmm. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us. And Thursday night is? I think it's chapter 8 of Exodus. Are we starting the Ten Commandments yet? No. No, we still got to get through the rest of the plagues. We've only done one plague so far. Oh, that's right. It's frogs. Frogs <laughs> are next. Frogs. And in the kids' Bible study we do, we're starting the Ten Commandments. Yeah. I like them. Okay. We love y'all. Have a wonderful week and be blessed.